Hey everyone, welcome back. You learned that Python is a powerful tool for data professionals and lets you analyze data with speed, accuracy, and efficiency. In this video, we'll continue to build on your foundation of Python knowledge. In previous videos in the Python for Data Science playlist, we've been exploring variables, expressions, data types, and data structures. In this video, we'll consider some other important components of programming in Python. Let's start with functions in Python. A function is a body of reusable code for performing specific processes or tasks. We've come across a few built-in Python functions so far. For instance, the print function writes text on the screen. Note that if we're using a single quotation in the text, we have to use double quotation with print function or we'll get an error. The type function tells us the data type contained within a variable and the str function converts an object into a string. Note that in previous version of Python, print was handled as a statement and did not use parentheses. But for Python 3, the print syntax is a function and requires parentheses, even when there are no arguments used and the parentheses are empty. Okay, so we know that Python has many built-in functions, but if we want to tell a computer to do other things particular to our own use cases, it's important to know how to define our own functions. To define a function, we use the keyword word def at the start of the function block. When defining a new function, always begin with the def keyword. The name of the function comes next. Let's call it greeting. After that, we have the function arguments, also known as parameters. A function's arguments are always written in parentheses. The arguments are the things you give to the function to modify in some way. In this example, our function will have just one parameter, name. When we're done defining the arguments, close the parentheses, put a colon at the end, and hit enter to get to a new line. Now we can write the body of the function. This is where we say what we want the function to actually do. Note how the body is automatically indented to the right. In Python, lines of code are hierarchical. Any line that is indented pertains specifically to the less indented code that precedes it. We can add as many lines as we'd like to the body of the function, but each line must be indented to the right. Here, it's indented four spaces. You can use however many spaces you like, as long as you're consistent. However, four spaces is usually the preferred way because it makes code more readable. Our greeting function will take a name and output a greeting using that name. We'll have the function print welcome the person's name, and then on a new line, print, you are part of the team. To finish defining the function, simply unindent the next line of code. Now we can call the function using the word Anna. Inside the parentheses, we'll type the name Anna, then we'll run the cell. Of course, functions can do a lot more than print messages. This is just one simple example of defining your own function. Next, let's consider how to get values out of function. This is where return values can be used. Return is a reserved keyword in Python that makes a function do work to produce new results. But instead of printing the results, the function saves them for later use. Let's define a new function that accepts two arguments, the base and height of a triangle, and returns the area of the triangle. The area is calculated as base times height divided by two. We use the keyword return to tell Python that this is the value that we want to come out of the function. Instead of printing, return lets us store this value in a variable. So, suppose we have two triangles and want to add the sum of both areas. Here's what we would do. First, calculate the two areas separately, storing each value in its own named variable. Then add the two areas together, assigning the results to a variable called total area. If we call this variable, the Jupyter Notebook returns its value, but we don't have to call it. This demonstrates the power of the return statement. It enables us to combine function calls with other operations, which makes the code reusable. Reusability involves defining code once and using it many times without having to rewrite it. Reusing something takes a lot less time and effort than recreating it every time. Let's do one more. Here's a function called getSeconds. This function takes hours, minutes, and seconds as inputs and returns the total number of seconds those inputs represent. 
In the first line, we begin with the keyword word def and name the function get seconds. In the parentheses, we give it three parameters, hours, minutes, and seconds. The next line performs a computation that calculates the total number of seconds and assigns that value to a variable called total seconds. The third and final line is the return statement that returns the value of total seconds. When we call the function, we have to give it three arguments, hours, minutes, and seconds. We'll use 12 hours, 48 minutes, and 30 seconds. And there's our result, 46,110 seconds. Now you understand more about functions and how to use the return keyword to save the results of a function for later output. Code reuse is a key element of Python that you will continue to appreciate as a data analytics professional. As we've discussed, reusability involves defining code once and using it many times without having to rewrite it. Consider this example. This script uses the length function, which returns the length of an object. In this case, it's the number of characters in a string. Then, it uses that length to calculate a number, which we're calling the lucky number. Finally, it prints a message with the name and the number. Each time we want to perform the calculation, we change the values of the variables and write the formula. Notice how there are exactly two lines that are the same in the first and second part of the code. When you find code duplication in your scripts, it's a good idea to check if you can clean things up by using a function. Let's rewrite this code, creating a function to group all the duplicated code into just one line. This updated script gives us the exact same results as the original one, but it's cleaner and easier to understand. Best of all, it's now reusable. We can execute the code inside the lucky number function as many times as we need to by just calling it with a different name. Because of its modular nature, Python is well suited to making code reusable. Modularity is the ability to write code in separate components that work together and that can be reused for other programs. Reusing code blocks can help you more effectively collaborate with data engineers on larger projects so that they don't have to start their code from the beginning. Here's an example. These variable names don't really tell us anything about what this code is trying to do. We can run it, and yes, it does something, but it was pretty difficult to read and understand that code. So, let's try to make this code clearer for other users. Refactoring is the process of restructuring code while maintaining its original functionality. This is a part of creating self-documenting code. Self-documenting code is code written in a way that is readable and makes its purpose clear. This involves everything from selecting your variable names to writing clear, concise expressions. Comments are a helpful, supplemental explanation of the code. When your computer registers the hashtag character in front of the comment line, it knows to ignore everything that comes after that character on that line. So, let's refactor this code to make it self-documenting. Now the intent and construction of our code is more clear. It's also broken up into functions and commented sections. Commenting is a useful practice because it helps you think about your process while documenting your workflow for other collaborators. Although messy code doesn't necessarily cause a script to fail, the cleaner the code, the more useful it is for the rest of your team. Your colleagues will appreciate clean code because they can understand and reuse it to save themselves both time and effort. Plus, Code reuse and modularity reduces errors and enhances teamwork. We mentioned that lines of code that began with a hashtag don't get executed and instead serve as comments for the human reading the code. Now, you'll learn more about commenting and why it's such an important part of writing good code. Building good coding habits will enable you to use Python effectively when using data to inform solutions to business problems. Let's begin with algorithms which will help you learn to think like a programmer and translate instructions into Python code. In programming languages, an algorithm is a set of instructions for solving a problem or accomplishing a task. Every computerized device is given instructions in the form of algorithms as hardware or software-based routines to perform its functions. That's why it's important to know how to explain things logically to the computer. This is what it means to think algorithmically. You've already started to think this way because you've learned about functions and functions are algorithms. 
As your coding skills develop, you'll be able to write longer and more complex functions. The best way to approach writing a new function is to break it into small, simple pieces, beginning with the comments. Outlining the comments and steps before you even write the code helps you to better understand the problem. Let's review an example. Suppose we have a square fountain and we want to plant grass in a border around that square. Let's write a function to calculate the amount of grass seed we'll need if we know the length of the side of the fountain and the width of the grass border. As always, begin with the def keyword. We'll name the function seed calculator. Its parameters will be the two things we know, the fountain side length and the width of the grass border. Now, we'll write the body of the function, breaking it into small steps that we'll outline with comments. First, we'll find the area of the fountain. Next, we'll calculate the total area of the square and the grass border combined. From these, we can derive the area of just the grass border by subtracting one from the other. Then, we'll calculate the amount of seed we'll need, which is 35 grams per square meter. We'll have to convert that to kilograms because that's what we set the function would output. And finally, we have the return statement. We use comments to create a logical scaffolding before writing any code in the body of this function. In other words, we use comments to break down the thought process that outlines each segment of code that we'll need in order to meet our goal. The only thing left for us to do is fill it in with code step by step. We can get the total area by finding the length of one side of the larger outer square and squaring it. The length of the large square is equal to the width of the border times two, plus the length of the side of the fountain. So we'll code that as total area equals fountain side plus two times the grass width. And we'll take that whole expression and square it. The area of the grass border is equal to the total area minus the fountain area. Then, the amount of seed we'll need is the grass area times 35 grams per square meter. Next, we convert grams per square meter to kilograms per square meter by dividing by 1,000 and return our seed variable. We're almost done. There's another important part of writing functions that are user-friendly and easy to understand. It's called a document string or doc string as it's most commonly referred to. The doc string is a string at the beginning of a function's body that summarizes the function's behavior and explains its arguments and return values. A function's doc string begins and ends with three quotation marks. They can be single quotes or double quotes. First, we write what the function does. It takes the form of a command and ends in a period. Like, calculate the number of kilograms of grass seed needed for a border around a square fountain. Next, we'll describe the function's parameters. Ours has two. We have fountain side, which is numerical data that represents the length of one side of the fountain meters. Then, we have grass width, which is also numerical data, and it represents the width of the grass border in meters. Lastly, we'll describe what the function returns. This function returns the seed variable, which is a float that indicates the amount of grass seed needed for the border in kilograms. Great, we have a function that performs a complex task and can be used as many times as we need. Using comments to break up the parts of the problem allowed us to solve it in clear, simple steps. Best of all, other people can use this code and understand exactly what it's doing because we've written a doc string in concise comments. So how much seed do we need if our fountain is a square that's 13 meters long on a side and we want a three meter border of grass around it? 6.72 kilograms. Comments act as a scaffolding that breaks up your code into manageable pieces. Along with the functions doc string, they help you and others understand and use your code. It's important for data professionals to get into the habit of writing well-documented code. It's a little more work up front, but you'll thank yourself later, and so will your colleagues. That's all for now. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay updated.
In the next video, we will learn about conditional statements. Thanks for watching and see you soon.